One evening, as I sat with a hot cup of tea and a delicious looking pakoda, something whisked past me, turned around and sat right on top of my pakoda. Normally I would get irritated, but today I sat looking at this tiny little fly. It had extremely intricate wings. I was amazed with the level of detail. As I continued staring at it, I exhaled and in an instant, the fly was gone. I was amazed how these insects can fly so well. I wanted to understand how these insects are so skillful at flying. I set out to find some of these answers. This is an airfoil. Let's assume for the time being that the cross section of the insect wing looks like this. When the insect flaps its wing, the airfoil moves like this. This is nothing but a series of translations and rotations. According to literature, there are three reasons attributed to high lift generation in flapping flight. The first is that of the leading edge vortex. As the airfoil translates, a whirlpool of fluid that starts at the leading edge of the airfoil is generated over the upper surface. This whirlpool is called the leading edge vortex and is associated with low pressure. The lower surface of the airfoil comparatively is subject to higher pressures and this difference of pressure contributes to a high lift generation. The second aspect of high lift generation is that of rotational forces. As the airfoil rotates near the ends of stroke, it is subject to high rotational accelerations which also contribute to lift. The third aspect of high lift generation is the wing-wake interaction. As the airfoil flaps, it releases whirlpools of fluid into the surroundings and these whirlpools of fluid called the vortices are collectively called the wake. So as the airfoil flaps, it interacts with its wake, uses the energy available in the wake to enhance its lift. For my study, I considered a specific type of motion which involves a translation, a rotation, a translation, a rotation and so on. The reason I chose this kind of motion is that the lift response can now be demarcated into a translational phase and a rotational phase and this facilitates compar comparison of the lift forces attributed to each of these phases. I consider three cases of flapping, all of which have the same duration of translation but different durations of rotation. In all the three cases, I found <coughs> that majority of the lift is generated during the translational phase compared to the rotational phase. To understand the effects of the wing-wake interactions, I considered two additional cases, one that of pure translation in which the airfoil just translates from one end of the stroke to another in a still fluid in the absence of a wake, and the second case, that of pure rotation in which the airfoil rotates from one angular position to another again in a still fluid. When I superimpose the response of the pure translation and the pure rotation over the flapping response, the difference would highlight the effect of wing-wake interactions. I found that the wing-wake interactions affect the translational part more than the rotational part. However, the duration of rotation determines to what extent the translational part is affected by the wing-wake interaction. The faster the airfoil rotates, the stronger the vortices released into the wake are and therefore the effect on the translational response is more significant. So I would like to summarize my findings now. The translational lift is much higher than the rotational lift for the kinematics that I considered. As far as the wing-wake interactions are concerned, the translational response is more significantly affected by the wing-wake interaction as compared to the rotational response. However, the rate of rotation determines to what extent the wing-wake interactions affect the translational response. I hope I've conveyed something about flapping flight. Thank you so much for your attention.